Okay, well, I would like to thank all of you, and actually I would like to thank Maraf because um, I can tell you that immunotherapy has really evolved. Um, he and I are pretty much the same age, and we've been doing this for about 20 years. And I can tell you that when I started my fellowship, and at least at Hopkins, you had to figure out what kind of research to do afterwards, and I went to the program director, and I said that I wanted to study immunotherapy, and this was a guy that did drug development, uh, classic chemotherapy drug development. And he looked at me and he said, Ivan, do you believe in this immunotherapy stuff? And I said, well, actually I do. And um, you know, as Mada said, this has become, I think, the fourth pillar of, of treatment for cancers. Now, myeloma is not a surgical disease, but historically the treatments of cancer have been surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, and, and we do have immunotherapy. And um, we now have actually several FDA approved products <clears throat> both in um, solid tumors as well as in, uh, in liquid tumors and in myeloma. And so I also think that it's a foreign language. I mean, it was a foreign language to me when I started. I'm sure it's a foreign language to you. And fortunately, I'll be saying a lot of the same things that Mada said, which means that neither one of us are telling you a lie. Um, and, and hopefully, I think hearing it several times, um, some of it will stick. So, you know, one of the major differences, I think, is, and, and Mada alluded to this, is. Historically, we've used chemotherapy to treat myeloma, um, whether it was steroids, which was the very early chemotherapy, or melphalan, which again was the early chemotherapy, followed by a whole bunch of other things. And I have to say that most of the therapy that we're using nowadays, although we call it chemotherapy, technically, in one sense, isn't chemotherapy because it doesn't kill dividing cells. Drugs like Reblimid, Kyprolis, Belcate, they don't kill dividing cells but we still call it chemotherapy. Um, but I've highlighted here on this slide sort of what some of the, um, okay, what some of the differences are. So chemotherapy is non-selective for the most part, and it works very quickly. And because it's a drug, and all drugs in our body are destroyed by enzymes produced in the liver or destroyed by the kidneys, it has a finite duration. So it lasts a few hours, it may last a little bit longer than that but it certainly doesn't last weeks or months. Immunotherapy is very different. Um, it's a network of cells, and you heard a little bit about it um, earlier, and I will talk to you a little bit about it as well. It's also targeted therapy, and I think one of the key differences is that it has a slow onset. Whether we talk about vaccines, which obviously we're all wearing masks because of our need for vaccines, but you know, and I think that's a prime example of it. Uh, you cannot get a COVID vaccine and then be exposed to COVID within two hours and expect to be immune um, and protected. It takes weeks for that immunity to, to develop. But the good news is that it also takes years for it to, I mean, it can persist for years. And in fact, the cells that make the antibodies are plasma cells. And plasma cells are the malignant cell in myeloma which may also be one of the reasons why getting rid of those cells is so difficult because these cells intrinsically have been built to last a whole lifetime. We know that we can vaccinate a two-year-old against polio and when they're 60, 70, 80 years old, they still have some of that immunity because of these long-lived plasma cells, which from an immune system is a good thing, from a cancer system can be a significant barrier. So, in general, what is being discussed right now is, like with everything, there are patients that respond to treatment and there are patients that don't respond to treatment. And certainly immunotherapy is no different than anything else. And so people have begun to look at this and basically have divided cancers into three different categories. Inflamed cancers, or what we would otherwise call hot cancers. Uh, immune desert cancers, which we would otherwise call cold cancers. And then sort of the things in between. And this is important because what's been clear that the low-lying fruit or these inflamed cancers are the ones that are more responsive to immunotherapy. So for example, the prototypical hot or inflamed cancer is melanoma. Now it sounds like myeloma, but it's obviously not the same disease. And this is a disease for which we've seen a lot of um, clinical activity. Um, traditionally, immune desert cancers are, for example, brain tumors, uh, glioblastomas. And the question is, is immunotherapy going to make hot cancers hotter, and therefore we should only focus on this group, or can we take cold cancers and make them hot? This is an area of active ongoing research. The answer is probably yes and yes to some extreme, um, but still not really clear. 
The other aspect of this is that I want to take a little bit of time, and, and Madoff alluded to this, is that there are, the immune system is a very, very complicated thing, going from a cellular level to a macro level, to a whole body level. And what this cartoon shows here is the T cell, which you heard of earlier, is the cell that has been primed to fight viruses and also primed to fight tumors. So any kind of anti-tumor immunity that you are going to develop is going to be by eliciting a tumor-specific T cell response that then has to engage with a dendritic cell or, interestingly, a myeloma cell has many of these dendritic cell functions. So there are a variety of words on this, on this slide, and I'm not going to belabor um, to go through all of them, all, other than to say, unless people are colorblind, you can see that there's red and there's green. And what these are, are the mechanisms that can regulate that tumor T cell interaction. So the green ones are the ones that when the T cell engages with the dendritic cell or the myeloma cell can activate the T cell. Um, and the red ones are the ones that can suppress the T cell. So think about this as an automobile. There's a brake in a car, um, there's a brake in an accelerator. And to drive, you either have to press the accelerator all the way down or you have to remove the brake. And unfortunately, what happens in cancer is that these brakes are really, really down. And so there, are, there have been drugs or antibodies, actually, that have been developing to basically block these brakes. And so the net result of blocking the brake is acceleration. So in cancer, what you see is an excess of this immunosuppressive state, this, this break, this unresponsive uh, state. In contrast, there are diseases for which the accelerator is pressed. Those are autoimmune diseases, uh, lupus, uh, multiple sclerosis, um, are the diseases in which this is overactive. And in fact, a lot of those strategies have been to remove the foot from the accelerator. But I want to emphasize this point just to mention that we have now gotten to the point that we can understand what these interactions are between tumors and T cells and can regulate them. There have been two antibodies that have been developed, uh, one that blocks this protein called CTLA-4 and another one that blocks this protein called PD-1 that have now become FDA approved and have really transformed melanoma, non-small cell lung cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, a variety of solid tumors that has really revolutionized the overall outcome of a lot of these patients. Unfortunately, PD-1 was tried in myeloma in random, or PD-1, an anti-PD-1 actually, anti means it's an antibody. And those trials were stopped several years ago because in combination with revlimid and dexamethasone or pomalidomide and dexamethasone, it actually looked like it was slightly more toxic, which gets into a whole nother story. Suffice it to say that these checkpoint inhibitors, at least in myeloma right now, are not necessarily something that is being actively developed but nevertheless, I think are important to understanding why and how the immune system can be regulated. Another aspect of this is the location as Mara um, described. And what I've um, depicted here is basically a cartoon that the goal is for the, for the soldiers, the T cells, to attack the tumor. But there, like with any kind of a military structure, there's a fortress and there are a variety of different um, cells and products produced by these cells that basically impair this from happening. And so, like with so many aspects of immunotherapy, there have people that have tried to target these cells right, right here, which are, um, are called myeloid-derived suppressor cells, which as the name implies, suppresses the immune system. Um, there are other cells called regulatory T cells or Tregs, which as the name implies, regulates T cell function and so suppresses the immune response. There are a variety of, of proteins and, and, and products that are produced by these cells, as well as by the tumor itself, that ultimately leads to the suppression. So the take home message here is not to memorize this, there isn't going to be a test at the end, but to understand that there is a molecular regulation and there is a cellular uh, regulation. And what's evolving, and again, this was alluded to, is a macro regulation, the intestinal microbiome. These are the bacteria that live in our gut. And this is a very novel, uh, well, not, it's not that novel, but it's a very interesting and exciting evolving concept. The area that makes the most sense for this to have developed in has been in colon cancer. And if you think about it, right, you've got bacteria in your gut, the colon can develop in your gut, and therefore what those bacteria are can regulate the outgrowth of those, col of those colonic tumors. It's turning out that this is really playing a significant role in a lot of other diseases, including myeloma. 
Um, and what you can see here is that basically there are bacteria, and we all know that most of our, uh, most of, of our fecal material, for example, is bacteria. Um, and there can be good bacteria and there can be bad bacteria. And these bacteria, whether they're good or bad, ultimately through a series and cascade of events can significantly impact the overall outcomes of the immune system, leading either to a productive immune system, which can have anti-cancer properties, or to an unproductive immune system. And here is some data actually looking at myeloma patients where you can see that there are uh, blue and, um, and red dots. And unfortunately, I can't really, oh, I think the red, yes. The red are myeloma and the blue are healthy. And what you see here basically is that the two separate out. That when they look at the intestinal microbiome content, in other words, the bacterial content of patients with myeloma, they are very different from the intestinal fecal material of, of, of healthy donors. And interestingly, when they take this fecal material and give it to mice, feed it, they can see that and, and, and challenge the mice with tumors. So they gave antibiotics to basically sterilize the mice. And then they gave the mice um, a, a tumor followed by these, these three different fecal controls. So one of them was healthy donor fecal material, which is in blue. Uh, the red was myeloma fecal material or just uh, saline as a control. You can see that the tumor outgrowth from the myeloma pa from the patients that from the mice that received fecal material from myeloma patients grew out much quicker than the, the mice that received fecal material from healthy humans. And then they went on and did another experiment and basically looked at bad bacteria in contrast to good bacteria. And again, you can see that the bad bacteria in the red caused a significant increase in tumor outgrowth compared to uh, the good bacteria. So this concept of the intestinal microbiome, again, alluded to earlier um, by, by Madoff, is really something that is rapidly evolving and you can see that there are a variety of different kinds of clinical trials that are going on looking at this from um, simple eating probiotics. I've listed a lot of these here because oftentimes patients come to me and I'm sure to all of us and I'm, maybe all of you had this, you know, you, you were just diagnosed with myeloma, you were just diagnosed with smoldering or with AMGUS. Is there anything that I can do to change? Now, I will tell you that there is no data currently to suggest that any of these interventions matter. But what I always tell my patients is that I think in general, a healthy lifestyle is probably going to lead to healthier outcomes. And I think there's some evidence here to suggest that basically, if you stay away from uh, foods that are high in red meats, high in um, animal fats, and more on the, uh, on the vegetable side of things, for the most part, it's going to be healthier. Uh, probiotics may have some sort of an impact, and you can see here that um, there really isn't any outcome from these trials that are being read. But I personally think that from a patient perspective, this is something that is relatively easy to begin to do in terms of a, of a lifestyle. Greg alluded to the fact that I'm Italian. I think there's a lot of evidence to suggest that the Mediterranean diet is probably better than you know, a Northern European type of diet, uh, certainly focused a lot more on vegetables. Um, but you know, it's at least something to think about. And uh, maybe we can talk about that later. So. Switching topics, I think all of you are probably well aware of the fact that, you know, there is a lot of immunotherapy that's out there, and we're hearing these words, and we're hearing about CAR T cells, and bispecific antibodies, and antibody drug conjugates, and, and what are these things? Um, and so I wanted to take a little bit of time to try to explain this to you. So the first thing to talk about are immunomodulators, and I'm sure any patient in this room that is on treatment for their myeloma has been on an immunomodulator. Uh, the earliest ones that were developed were thalidomide, then lenalidomide, which if you're not familiar with the uh, um, generic name is revlimid, and then pomalidomide, which is pomalis. So uh, I would venture to say that probably all of you uh, have been on at least one of those three drugs. And there are newer ones that are being developed with the same concept of modulating the immune system. It's not specifically targeting any one pathway or any one molecule. It's just leading to this global immune activation. And it has, in fact, and then there are a series of antibody-based therapies. And so I wanted to take some time to explain that to you. So this is an antibody. So for the most part, you can see here, so this is not the remedial medical school class. This is the first year medical school class. So an antibody is a Y-shaped a structure that has the long part is called the heavy chain, and the short part is called the light chain. And you can see that the blue is the part that actually recognizes what the antibody is supposed to recognize. So 
It can recognize a COVID protein. It can recognize an influenza flu virus protein. It can recognize anything. This is where the, what we call the specificity of the antibody lies. And then there's, so this is the, the variable region. And then there's a constant region, which gives stability to this antibody so that it doesn't get degraded and also can set up a cascade of events that actually amplifies this immune response. And so listed here, and I won't spend too much time talking about a lot of these other than the ones that I think are more clinically relevant. So one of them is, well, actually this isn't all that relevant for myeloma, but here, antibody drug conjugates. So you can see here that this is an antibody to which a chemotherapy is attached to it. And as it's depicted here, it's attached to the tail. So the antibody that is currently clinically available in myeloma for this is belantamab or blincito. So it's a BCMA targeted antibody to which there is a chemotherapy, a very strong chemotherapeutic agent attached to it. It's so strong that in fact, we cannot just give that chemotherapy because we would kill patients. But if it's done in a way that it only really goes to those targeted cells, which in this case are the myeloma cells that express this BCMA protein, we can then deliver very high doses of chemotherapy locally and hopefully have some sort of a targeted effect. So that's what antibody drug conjugates are. There are bispecific antibodies. So again, I told you that the blue part of this or the variable region recognizes the protein that it's trying to target. So let's talk about BCMA. So in a natural antibody, both arms, the, the arm on the left and the arm on the right recognize the BCMA. And so both of them target the myeloma cell and, and the arm of it is what then sets off this immune response. But I hope that both of us, uh, Madoff and myself, have shown you that really what mediates a lot of the anti-tumor response is the T-cell response. So if we could get the antibodies to work, but also have the T-cell response come in, we could potentially augment this response. And so that's what these bispecific antibodies do. Basically, these are genetically engineered, as you can see here, with a blue and a green. Basically what that means is that the blue is targeting for the most part BCMA, we'll use that as an example, and the green is bringing in something else. That something else that we're currently using a lot of is a molecule called um, anti-CD3. CD3 is a molecule that is present on the surface of T cells. So what's happening is that this antibody is targeting the myeloma and then it has this other arm that's allowing the T cells to come in and the T cells in proximity to the, to the tumor itself can kill the tumor that much better than if these T cells are just circulating around. And this has actually um, been very effective therapy. Um, certainly in um, the first one of these that has been developed has been in ALL, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, where uh, it's CD3 on one side and another molecule called CD19 present on a lot of these leukemic type cells. But there is a lot of evidence to suggest that these bispecifics um, in, uh, in, in myeloma are also working, again, targeting uh, BCMA. Now, what this lacks, as you can see from this cartoon, is all of the orange. So it's not a very stable compound. And as a result of that, it generally needs to be given very frequently, oftentimes with a pump, because it's degraded so quickly. So it's not very practical. But what groups have done now has been to redesign these, these bites, actually, not bispecific, bites is what they're called, to become bispecific antibodies. So it's basically this, where one side is blue and the other side is green, but having the heavy chain, it can actually be a very stable molecule, and instead of being given as, with a pump by continuous IV, can now be given once every two weeks or three weeks or four weeks. These, these bispecific antibodies are in clinical trials, are currently being looked at, and are showing to be very, very promising. The last thing that I want to talk about, because I'm sure you've all heard about it, are CAR T cells. So the word CAR stands for chimeric antigen receptor. Okay, so it's really chimeras, if you remember from Greek mythology, are these animals that are half human and half lion or whatever. And that's what this is. And so you can see from this cartoon, that what it does is that it takes the variable region here of, that recognizes, in this case, BCMA, but, so on the outside of it, it's an antibody, but on the inside of it, it has all the T cell mechanisms. That's where the chimerism comes from. It's antibody on the outside and T cell on the inside. By having these T cell mechanisms on the inside, it can basically turn these T cells on and make them do what they need to do. 
But instead of having the T cells initially be turned on through their normal T cell function, it's being turned on through this antibody. And the benefit of this kind of approach is that it's not HLA restricted. So again, Madoff told you that each one of us is different and we all have our own HLA. So I cannot take my cells and put them into you because your body will reject my cells because of this HLA uh, difference. That's what our immune system has developed. But antibodies don't have this restriction. So I can make a BCMA car and put it in one BCMA car and put it into each one of our cells and that same car will work for each for every single one of them, one of us. Now, my, my car has to go into my cells and your car has to go into your cells, but it's the same car. So from a manufacturing perspective, that's a little bit less complicated, but still you can see that the, the basis of this is still an, in a way an, a hybrid antibody based therapy. So again, we've got um, uh, immunomodulators, naked antibodies, which um, really have not been used that much in, in myeloma, but certainly have in a lot of other uh, cancers antibody drug conjugates, bispecifics, and CAR T cells. So this is the mechanism of action that I told you of the bispecifics here. And again, without belaboring this point, but you can see that having the long arm of this allows uh, all of these other things basically to happen and to therefore uh, work. The benefit of this is that you can target BCMA with an off-the-shelf product. So again, it's not a T cell. So antibodies are universally uh, utilizable for everybody. Somebody walks in, I, we talk to them and say, we think a bispecific antibody would be the right therapy for you, write the prescription, tomorrow you can get the drug. But because it, it has a CD3 arm, I guess on this side, it also activates T cells. The ones that are commonly used right now and being developed are against BCMA, but, and Madoff alluded to this, or a variety of other ones, uh, this other protein is being looked at both as a car as well as as a bispecific and is showing very, very promising results. These are the data with uh, the CAR T cells. And so um, this is a Bluebird uh, CAR T, which is currently FDA approved. And I think one of the biggest things that we saw with CAR T cells, which has really, I think, elicited a lot of excitement um, in the field, certainly um, with regard to pediatric uh, leukemia, ALL, has been that these patients' immune systems can very, very quickly eradicate tumor. I mean, I think I, I, I was at a talk once that somebody did the calculations and figured out that one T cell could kill something like a thousand tumor cells. And if you think about who's getting these CAR T cells, these currently are people on their fifth, sixth, seventh line of therapy. So they're very heavily pretreated. They have a rather significant disease burden, and they're able to elicit a significant disease, uh, anti-tumor effect eliciting oftentimes a lot of toxicity with this thing called CRS or cytokine release syndrome. But nevertheless, we go from a lot of disease to a very little amount of disease, or hopefully negligible disease in a very, very short period of time. In leukemia and in lymphoma, certain types of lymphomas, the patients that achieve a complete remission for the most part look like they might be cured. We now have data going out three, four years, and those patients that have achieved a complete remission are staying in complete remission. Unfortunately, in myeloma, um, that's not necessarily the case. And you can see from this data right here that even the patients that got the higher dose, these curves are just continuing to come down. So this is with the Bluebird uh, CAR T cell. There's another CAR T cell which is also um, about to become FDA approved, which is the Janssen CAR T cell. And you can see here that these curves also appear to be going, um, coming down a little bit. But as I sort of alluded to earlier, the depth of the response correlates with the outcome. So in other words, if you can get into a complete remission, chances are that you're going to do a lot better than if you don't get into a complete remission. And you can see here that in blue, these are the patients that achieved a complete remission, and those curves, at least in the beginning, appear to be slightly better than the patients that got um, a very good partial response. So this is an autologous product. So again, targeting BCMA, but in order for patients to get on these studies, they have to be off chemotherapy for about two to three weeks. They have to get their, their T cells collected through a process called phoresis. So they're hooked up to basically like a dialysis machine where the blood is sucked out, the T cells are collected, and then it's returned. Then the T cells are, have to be shipped off to the company. They have to be made, and then they have to come back. So that whole process can take up to about two months. And so you can understand that for patients that are pretty sick, 
that have a high disease burden and that for whatever reason cannot be off chemotherapy for those two to three weeks of that washout period, this may not be the right kind of approach for them. Another approach that is being looked at are what we call off-the-shelf CAR T cells. And so this is where the immunology lecture that you got earlier from uh, Madoff is important. So HLA um, and a lot of other things, I remember telling you that I can, my T cells can only go into me. I cannot put my T cells into any of you. But what they can do and what has been done has been to modify these T cells in a way to make them invisible to anybody's immune system. Okay, so we can we can take T cells and genetically engineer them or even pharmacologically by cutting out or, or blocking certain key receptors so that now I can become almost a universal donor. So you can take my T cells and give them to other patients. And that's what is happening uh, with, with this kind of a trial right here where they've done this. And again, looking at BCMA as an approach, this was a trial that was reported and was looking at some of the data here. Now, interestingly, um, there are uh, some patients, so what they did not report in this trial, and this was data presented at ASH uh, in December, is what the true complete remission rate was compared to, they, they loved, if you can see here, stringent com complete, complete remissions, complete remissions and BGPR, which basically means a 90% reduction. So they're all lumped together, which in my opinion means that we probably don't have a lot of stringent complete remissions to be able to separate this data out. But the benefit of this, sort of like with uh, bispecific antibodies, is that theoretically you could get it tomorrow. It's an off-the-shelf product. Um, there have been, however, issues. Um, there is a lot of excitement with this approach, but recently this trial was stopped because they found that one of the products that was used had been genetically modified, uh, had been genetically altered. I'm sorry, genetically altered and actually upregulated a leukemic gene, and so there was a risk that these patients were not only being treated for their myeloma, but we're potentially at risk for developing another malignancy. And so the FDA has put this trial on hold um, and waiting to see what's going to come of that. I just want to conclude with um, some of the data and some of the stuff that we're doing. So, you know, might have alluded to the fact that we probably, our goal is to cure myeloma. And I would agree with him, but I would also tweak that comment a little bit to say, if we're not going to cure the disease, we at least need to put it into, revert it to, into what we call a myeloma MGUS. Myeloma MGUS is basically one of, these, one of these diseases that sit there, you can see them, but they never really do anything. And so we have uh, uh, created a vaccine um, called GVAX, uh, where we give it, we've given it to patients that were in a near complete remission. And so they had no detectable M spike, but there still was some other aspects of the disease that we could find treated them with this vaccine plus Revlimid and um, followed them. And, you know, the thing that, that was very surprising for us is that our overall, uh, median overall survival was seven and a half years, but we have not reached our median progression-free survival, basically meaning that people were dying um, from other causes. So uh, there were a few patients on this trial that died from a heart attack, not with no evidence of myeloma. Another patient died um, from old age, basically, with no evidence of myeloma. And we have these patients that are going out now, and you can see here, up to eight years, and less than half of them have re less than half of them have relapsed. Okay. And so we're very excited about this. But, in, but what I will also say is that the definition of relapse in myeloma, when you have, when you're in a complete remission, is that your M spike has to be greater than 0 0.5, 0 0.5. And we have a not insignificant number, probably half of these patients, that have a detectable M spike. So remember, to get into the trial, it had to be zero, but we have patients whose M spikes now have come back. They're 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, but they've never passed that threshold. And they've been sitting like that, you can see here, for up to seven, eight years. And so we believe that because of this approach, we have been able to educate the immune system, potentially not with the strength and power that a CAR T cell can, but with a sufficient amount of memory, like again, one of the benefits of immunotherapy is that it lasts a long time, that we can, that as this M spike continues to come up, there's just enough of an immune system to push it back down, but not enough of it to completely eradicate it, and that this disease is just sitting there forever. So based on this data, and it was a small trial of just 15 patients, we have now opened up a, a larger randomized trial of uh, 
50 patients or so, where patients are going to be randomized, either getting the vaccine or getting a placebo. And I know that from a patient perspective, nobody wants to be in the placebo arm, but from a clinical trial development, the only way that we're going to really ever know whether this works is by having a true control arm. And so I think that if this turns out to have similar data, this could be one approach that could become an established therapy for patients that have achieved a complete response, which is very different from what we're seeing with CAR T-cells, where the patients that have achieved a complete response with CAR T-cells appear to be relapsing within uh, a year to a year and a half. So um, that's all I have to say, and I guess uh, I'll leave it to Greg and we'll take questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you.